Hello. Welcome, everyone. And I'm sure we're going to have a, a few more trickling in here. We had a pretty high registration number for this one, like the last one. My name is Amelia. I am the content strategist here at Demco, and I'm going to be moderating today. I'm very, very excited to welcome you all here once again for another webinar with Kelsey Bogan. She is going to be uh, speaking on rethinking collection organization. So kind of a continuation of the webinar that we had in March on dynamic shelving, but you do not need to have attended that one to learn from this one. This is just expanding on some of those ideas, but it should be super beneficial. If you did miss the last webinar, it is available on Demco's ideas site, so you can go back and watch it. This one will be available on there in a few days. You will get emailed if you registered, so you'll get that link, but it will be available whether you lose the email or not, and it will be available whether you have to drop off for something, so don't worry. You're going to have access to this content after it's done. Um, I will be monitoring questions throughout, but it is a full schedule, so we don't anticipate uh, being able to interrupt during the presentation, so we will ask some questions at the end if there is time. And then any outstanding questions, I will work with Kelsey afterwards to get some answers that can be sent out with the final recording for you guys, um, along with the slides so that you can take a look at what she shared today. Um, and then if you, if you don't know, I'll do a little introduction of Kelsey and then I will turn it over to her. Uh, you're probably all very familiar with her, but she is a high school librarian, an adjunct MSLIS professor, and a professional speaker and presenter who enjoys helping librarians learn to leverage the power of social media for their library's advocacy, collection development, outreach, and community building efforts. She is an advocate for reform in the library um, profession, especially as it relates to outdated collection organization and development traditions. You can connect with her on Twitter at Kelsey Bogan. She's got a blog, don'tyoushushme.com, which you probably have uh, seen some of her dynamic shelving content on there. And we're just really excited to have her here to continue to, to educate. And I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Kelsey. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining me uh, for us to continue our conversation from last time. I know that last time we had a lot of questions from people that were interested in talking about um, genrefication and Dewey and and all of that kind of thing. So that's kind of what we're going to jump into today. And that's where we're going to go uh, to talk about. So, all right, let me get these slides advanced here. Okay. So we're going to talk about rethinking collection organization today. The um, main point is in our efforts to create accessible and independently navigable collections. That's always um, kind of one of the things that are at the forefront of my my mind when I'm making plans for, for what to do to the library or policies or organization or collection development. It's, I usually wanna always be pushing towards um, greater accessibility and, and making the space and the resources more independently accessible and navigable. So that's kind of what a lot of these suggestions sort of relate around with that being the ultimate kind of goal. So, why rethink organization? So we all kind of know a lot of the traditional and typical ways of organizing libraries, um, you know, some of it is still taught in library school, or we learn it when we're doing our mentorships or our on the job trainings. And there are traditions that have, you know, lasted a really long time and that are kind of um, almost considered ubiquitous with libraries. Um, so why would we challenge some of those norms and why would we start to rethink how we do things? The main purpose of the library is to serve the current and emerging needs of today's library user community. I think sometimes that gets a bit lost amongst tradition and amongst a sometimes a bit of an almost almost like a museum kind of like a belief like sometimes there's a little bit of a mix up between what the purpose of a library is as composed to a an archive or maybe a museum so i think it's really important that that we kind of remember that most public or school libraries um for most public and school libraries the purpose of the library is to serve the current and emerging needs of our current library users so that really is one reason for us to keep that in mind, just to rethink organization, is that 
current and emerging needs of today's current library users is almost certain to be quite different than the needs of users in the past. So, you know, continual change is kind of to be expected and to be embraced. When you're thinking about this, whether you want to do any of this stuff or not, you know, ask yourself, is your library organized in a way that best works for your current library user community? So this is where we do our needs assessments and we do our analyzing and we collect our, our data, our quantitative and our qualitative, and we look at how things are being used, if things are being used, how the space is being navigated, what common questions patrons are constantly asking, um, where, what, are the, what are the barriers to access that we're seeing them encounter, um, the stumbling blocks, the things that just aren't quite working, the things that we think, oh, I wonder if it would be better if it was this way instead. Those are the things that we wanna be taking note of because those are the things that are telling us that maybe our libraries aren't organized currently or laid out currently in ways that are best working for our current library users. And that's where we can find and identify those places for possible change. That's the purpose of it. It's not, you know, it's not just because, oh, this new flashy thing is trending in library world, or, you know, there was, you know, there's this one cool thing I saw on social media, librarian do, like, of course, that that's inspiration. But we also want to tie everything we do to purpose, you know, intentional, striving to meet the needs of our users. What needs aren't currently being met? What barriers to access are we seeing with the way things are now? What can we change to make things more accessible, to make things work better for the current users? That's really the primary purpose of rethinking organization. And if you keep that as your driving focus, you know, that's going to be, that's going to keep you moving in the right direction. And, you know, that's going to help smooth away some of your doubts, maybe, is, you know, the purpose of why you're trying this new thing, then if that purpose is tied clearly to needs, then it's a much easier um, argument for yourself or for your, um, your, um, whoever's in charge that you need to convince. So, you know, if you identify barriers, and if you notice things that aren't working, that's your opportunity to to sit down and make some plans and do some dreaming and and look for some inspiration to figure out what kind of changes you can make that could ensure better accessibility better relevancy and better independent navigation for your users that's always going to be um, the goal so is this working if it's not what could i do to change it to make it work better Sometimes these solutions are going to be small scale, little things. Sometimes they might be really big scale, you know, institutional change type things. It runs the gamut and there should be a little bit of something for everybody in this presentation, I hope, from big to small changes, whatever, um, whatever you're looking for inspiration for, or maybe you're looking for permission from somebody to tell you it's okay to let go of this old way of doing it. Um, or you're just looking for some ideas to see what other people are doing. Hopefully that will be what happens in the presentation today. So let's talk about some of the changes um, that I've tried and that uh, other librarians have tried and see what, uh, if anything, rings for you. As we go through this, I know sometimes um, some people can get a little uncomfortable about, you know, some of the rules being challenged or, um, some traditions being changed or disrupted. So I think it's important to start out with um, remembering that all of the rules are all made up. The rules were all made up. In library world, all of these rules that we follow, these traditions, these policies, these processes, they were all made up at some point in time by somebody. And there might have been good reasons for when, why they were made up, when they were made up. But that doesn't mean that they're still applicable or that they're still working for your current your current users now. So just remember, these rules were all made up at one point. Somebody decided this was the rule and then, you know, we all went with it. But rules are meant to be changed. Rules are meant to be responsive to needs. So it's okay to challenge some of these um, rules or traditions. And, and it's okay if they're working for you to keep some of them too. But we should always be questioning at the very least whether these things are working for our patrons or not. All right, so here's the topics that we're going to talk about today. 
going to start with a little bit of a a little bit of a talk about genrefication. Ditching Dewey will come next. Those are kind of big scale changes, and then we'll talk about some of the smaller the smaller changes that are not quite so not requiring quite so much commitment as the first two. We'll talk about displays or, or pull-out collections, mini collections, and we'll talk about signage. And so this is kind of how I, I chunk these up. Genrefication, ditching Dewey, and displays or mini collections is kind of part of chunking. Chunking collections can help make collections more accessible and more independently navigable. And then the signage is kind of about, you know, how providing clear directionals and, and navigation can help, you know, again, increase that access and that navigation for our users. So this is the agenda for today. We'll start with genrefication. Genrefication has been on the scene in library world for, well, since before I came into the profession, because they talked about it when I was in library school. I think it's from 2010 or earlier it was when it started to kind of become a major topic of conversation in library world so some of you may have um, tried it or maybe thinking about trying it or you may have seen other people that have tried it but if you don't know what genrefication is is organizing the fiction collection into genre groups first um, it is sometimes referred to as the bookstore model. It is a common way for books, bookstores commonly organize in a similar way where they, they group books according to their genres first. And then after that, usually alphabetical by author, just like it would in a standard, um, a standard kind of Dewey order. So it's important to know that if you genrefy, you may choose genres that are different from other libraries and that's okay. And, but usually the genres, you know, the books within the genre are still typically going to be in alphabetical order by author. So it's not like it's chaos. <laughs> it's not um, pure chaos and things just go wherever they want. There's still order. It's still quite similar to the traditional way. It's just instead of having one giant fiction collection A to Z, you chunk it up into some smaller collections by genre first and then have it A to Z after that. So this is a pretty common one. A lot of school libraries have begun moving towards it. I know it's public libraries have used it as well. Some people feel very split about genrefication. Some people are very, very pro and some people are very, very against and that's okay. We all, we all have different priorities and different things that work and don't work. But genrefication is something I do recommend for a lot of libraries, especially maybe with youth, if you're serving young people, I think it really increases access and makes the space a little bit less intimidating to, to users, but it may not work for everybody. But you can see my before and after from genrefying. So on the bottom left corner, my pictures of my fiction collection before it was genrefied, but after it was weeded, as you can tell, look how tidy the shelves are. That's because I had, I had just weeded them down before I took the picture. Um, so this is the collection where it's just in standard alphabetical A to Z order. We had probably two, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 books in just order, author, A to Z. And then I genrefied them and we chunked them up into about seven, I think I had seven genres initially. Um, and that's what it, then it looked like from there. So that was my genrefication. So why might you genrefy? What are what what are the arguments for it or the advocacy for it? Firstly, it helps chunk up a collection. I don't know if this is common. I suspect it is, especially with young people. But I was seeing students come into the library and leaving empty handed a lot when I first started. And what I was observing was them walking up to the fiction wall and kind of moseying down it a couple feet looking uninspired, overwhelmed, or disinterested, or sometimes just confused. And I was often seeing them after spending a little bit of time doing this, kind of meandering aimlessly, I was seeing them do one of two things. I was seeing them either visibly give up and just leave empty handed, or I was often seeing them go to one of the three authors they knew. Like uh, they would go and get another, get a Rick Reardon book they'd already read, recheck it out, or Cassandra Clare or whatever the popular author at the time was. And what I was noticing was that this was showing me that they didn't know, they didn't know how to find books they might like from browsing because there was nothing to go on. Author A to Z 
no covers facing out, no information about the books. If a student knows they like Rick Reardon, they know they like fantasy books, but there's no way for them to find other fantasy books from looking at the shelves like that. Whereas when you genrefy and you chunk things together, now, if they at least know they like Rick Reardon, now they can go to the fantasy section and have a small selection of books to choose from that have a high likelihood of similar interest for them. And now if they go to the Rick Reardon shelf, those books are surrounded by books that may be similar in vibe. And that helps students find things that they may also be interested in. It helps them find and discover new authors they may not know to have tried before. So the chunking is something that was really important to me when I tried genrefying. That was really the main reason for me to do it, was to help them be able to make a choice. Instead of just browsing the whole fiction wall, not knowing where to start, all they had to do was decide which of the seven available genres might be of most interest to them, and that gives them a starting place. Or they, they know they like one author, and now they can go to that genre with that author and maybe find other ones they might like too. So the chunking really helped with that user navigation and builds confidence. When my students come in now, of course, circulation increased, which is what I expected to happen because it does seem to be a consistent, a consistent result for people that do genrefy. Um, and it's because my students were finding, okay, they can find books now. They can find things they're interested in without having to ask or use the catalog. So let's not forget that, you know, use of a catalog is a special skill and we can't really assume everybody comes into the library knowing how to do it. So the more you can chunk, the more you can change and make things independently navigable and browsable, you're removing barriers of access because you're giving them more ways to navigate the space on their own, more clues <laughs> to go off of. If you're a school library or even a public library that is in close proximity to a school, it, genrefication can help you align your organization with curriculum or demonstrated interest. So when you're thinking about which genres to do, you might look at if you're in a school or you help serve a school, you might look at what are some of the common units of study, because that might be a good indicator of some genres to choose. Or you look at the common phrases student or users say to you when they come in. That's kind of how it helps you pick your genres. You know, what are the common things people are asking for or looking for? that will help guide you. So I noticed, you know, students were always coming in and asking for mystery books. And so that helped me know we needed a mystery section. But we also had um, English classes, units that, that wanted them to read realistic fiction, but we had some units that they were studying sort of um, dealing with adversity. And we had other units where they were wanting to read books that dealt with culture or identity. So that helped inform me with two kind of unique genres that weren't super common. I didn't see other schools doing them, but those two genres made sense in our school because it helped with curriculum. Same reason why our memoir, one of our memoir genres is, mem is um, Holocaust stories. That's because we have an elective for Holocaust stories. So it makes sense for us to have gen books genrefied for that because the class can find them more easily. Passive readers advisory is, of course, a big thing. Like uh, that's that independent navigation. You know, when people come in, they kind of have an idea of the type of story they want, um, but you don't usually have enough librarians to actually help every single person find some books that they might like. You know, staffing can be a struggle sometimes, and so we can help um, help them be able to help themselves more by that chunking of the collection. Good signage. Now they can walk in and if they know they need mystery, they don't have to ask you because they can see the mystery signs and go right over there to start looking. So that's kind of some of the some of the arguments for genrefication. All right, if you're going to genrefy, here's some of my top tips. Firstly, um, again, choose genres based on user requests or language. You know, you don't have to mimic exactly what another library does because their genres might not work for your community. Our communities all have slightly different needs and interests and trends. And um, so it's important to pay attention to the kinds of you know, requests and language used. If you're, um, you know, my students, they never call books realistic fiction, never. They never come in and ask for realistic fiction. So it wouldn't have made sense for me to have a realistic fiction section because that's not the language that they tend to use. So I have, you know, action and adventure, I have sports, I have humor, then I have relationships and identity, and I have adversity and overcoming. 
those are more the language that my students were using. So that's what made sense for me to create genres for. Plan which genres and how you'll label or catalog them before you start. It's really, this is kind of, there's a lot of back end to the genrefication process. It's important to have a plan. You know, know which genres you want to start with and know what your, what your plan is for labeling and cataloging them. Um, there's a lot of different schools of thought on how to how to label or catalog them for their genres. So I'm not going to get into all the different kinds today, but if you do your due diligence and see what how libraries do it, you can see my explanation on my blog very thoroughly how I do it. Um, you just want to make sure you know what your plan is. It's okay to go slow. I think it took me two years to get to genrefy. You know, I wasn't able to just sit and do it over the course of a summer. Sometimes people do that. But I just worked on tagging the books slowly over the course of a, a school year or two. And then once they were all tagged, it was really easy to move them and, and recatalog them. That only took a day. But actually figuring out every book's genre, that took me some time. And it's okay if it does take you some time. You can also get volunteers and use like, um, you know, tech tools that help you do it quicker. So whatever works for you. One of the biggest barriers to genrefication is that people often stress about how to know which genre to put it in. <laughs> And to that, I say, just don't stress about it. It's not a test. There's no right or wrong answer. Yes, books do cross genre. That's okay. If there's a specific book somebody wants, they don't have to guess which genre it's in because they can look up in the catalog and your catalog will tell them which shelf to go to find it. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about picking the wrong genre. People will still be able to find the book. All you have to do is go with your best instinct as to which genre makes most sense for your for that book for your community and if you notice after a year it's not circulating you can always move it to a different genre and try it again you know there's no this is not life and death picking a genre you don't need to do the entire collection maybe your collection is working pretty well for the most part as a general fiction but you're you're just thinking oh, we just get so many requests for mystery or we just get so many requests for historical fiction you could just make one section you don't have to do the whole collection you know you can triage do the priorities do what most is in need um and i started with just labeling and not moving so that was what i did first different things might work for different people but for me it made sense to label everything get everything a genre assigned and then moving it later all right so talking about labels <laughs> um, usually you're going to want to put some kind of physical label on the book so that your shelvers will know where to shelve the book there's a lot of different choices for you when it comes to the labels you will also want to put a catalog tag in as well so maybe you'll use sublocation or you'll change the call number or you'll um, you'll use copy category. There's different options, but you want to do two things for labeling the books. First, the physical label on the book so that shelvers know where to shelve it. And the second component is the cataloging so that people who do look books up in the catalog do know where to find it on the shelf. So there's a couple different ways to do labels. Um, some people go with the simple colored dot or the simple um, color label. And sometimes people like to go with the ones that have words on it or images on it. So there's tons of different options here. There's no right or wrong. It is complete preference. What works for you, what works for your budget, what works for how much of the spine space you want taken up and what your needs are. So I went with really simple labels actually from Demco. I got their three quarter inch circles and I cut them in half because I thought for me, the circle took takes up too much of the spine just from like a, Per personal preference kind of visual thing so I cut them into into half moons and I set the little half moon just above the spine label so you can see that on the left that's how I do my genres each color is associated with a different genre um, the numbers written on them is the year I bought the book that's just for me for weeding I put that on when I process them just so that when I'm weeding I can quickly see when that was added to the collection um, so you can see my little sharpie number 17 on these books um, but you can see that Demco also has a quite a wide variety of different styles and different types of and shapes even of all different kinds of labels. So this is linked in here. So when you do, you will have the slides. And if you click on this little tag down here, it will take you to all their different labels. There's a lot of different options. And um, pretty affordable too. I know some people that design their own, but I, unless you're going to have it printed on high quality paper, I, I'm not sure. Uh, our color printers at 
don't print them real nice so i buy them <laughs> but whatever works for you maybe you have a better printer than me all right let's talk about ditching dewey uh or adapting dewey so here's our next little remember remember because we've always done it this way is never a good enough reason i remind myself this a lot when it comes to traditions or processes or policies in our libraries we have to always be questioning why we're doing it and whether it's still working or not because having always done it this way just is never a good enough reason we should always interrogate why we're doing things and make sure we have a good reason for it otherwise it might be time to rethink and that's okay so what is ditching dewey or adapting dewey it is the process of organizing nonfiction books in systems other than the Dewey Decimal System. So Dewey Decimal System is pretty pretty traditional for most school and public libraries, most of them. Um, it's not typically used in college or university libraries. They would usually be using um, Library of Congress for the most part. Um, but in public and schools, still pretty common for Dewey to be the main system. When I talk about ditching Dewey, I, it could be ditching or adapting. It can be either the complete removal of Dewey, or it can be like an adaptation or flexible interpretation of Dewey. So just like with everything else, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Why might libraries ditch Dewey? Why are quite an increasing number of libraries ditching Dewey? There's a couple of main reasons I've identified. For me, there's three primary reasons to consider ditching Dewey or adapting it. Firstly, it being outdated, you know, it was developed in, in the 1800s. It was developed before a lot of parts of our life existed, and it it doesn't always handle those topics very sensibly because they came into kind of relevance after the system was already set. So, like, for example, you see where computers get put into Dewey. It doesn't always really make sense. Um, you see where um, anything medical related or especially mental health or psychology you know these sciences that didn't really become prominent and trusted until well after the system was created it it makes those topics don't always aren't always treated very well in the system and so it can be a bit outdated in its terminology in its treatment of marginalized folks um its treatment of neurodivergence uh, its treatment of lgbtq topics or particularly unsavory. Um, so the outdatedness is a big component for me as to why I question Dewey. And that goes in with the biases. Obviously, partly because of its time when it was created, it has significant biases that are enmeshed and embedded deeply into the system in ways that it can be hard to combat, um, but which do need to be addressed. It can also more simply just be ineffective for community needs. I don't know a single school librarian that thinks Dewey, especially at elementary school, that thinks the Dewey Decimal System really works that well for their collections because of the way students use the library, because of how specific our curriculum often is, because of how, how narrow in scope a lot of the topics are because it's for elementary. Um, I don't, you know, all those decimals. <laughs> often don't really make sense for, for the kind of categories that an, a common elementary school would need. So it can also just be often ineffective for our community's needs, I think, especially in small libraries, you know, which school libraries tend to be relatively small compared to public. So the categories can often just not really work for us. So those are the primary reasons to consider uh, changing it. What are some alternatives? Uh, there's lots of different ones. This is where you want to do your due diligence if you're thinking about making a change. Um, you could utilize Dewey's official alternatives. It does offer alternatives sometimes in the official you know, system. Um, for example, there is an alternative 200 category, category, categorizing. Um, so that Dewey's usual order of the 200s is, is extremely Christian-centric. Um, which just means that it gives a lot of categories to, you know, the religion for Christianity, um, but it doesn't give as many categories to a lot of other religions. So there is actually an official alternative 200s um, organization that Dewey has in its actual book 
that libraries can can use instead. Like it is an official alternative. It would you would still be using the Dewey Decimal System. You wouldn't be deviating. Um, so if you know if you're working somewhere where you're not allowed to get rid of Dewey, just be aware that there are alternatives in the official Dewey that might be something for you to look into using because you would be able to do that. I would think. Um, you can adapt the current Dewey as needed. Let's be honest, we've all been doing that anyway. <laughs> Most librarians have have at some point fudged a number here or there or moved a book to a category that it's not technically re recommended for because you think it makes more sense for your users. We've all been doing this anyway, and it is okay to do that on a larger scale if you want. If there's certain little things in, in the system that aren't working for you and it makes sense for you just to rearrange things a little bit, that's fine. You can do that. You know, you can simplify your decimal points if you if you want to. There's no Dewey police that are going to be coming for you. You can genreify while maintaining Dewey labels. This is a pretty common one in schools, at least that I've seen. They basically they basically do the same thing to the nonfiction that you do in a genreification of the fiction section. You leave the spine labels the same, so they would still have the normal Dewey spine labels but you add a quote unquote genre label as well. So let's say that you have, um, you put a genre label of animals on, and then you move all the books about animals into that section, and then you keep them in their Dewey order within that section. So that is an all, that is a, a probably a pretty simple way to do, do to ditch Dewey, to kind of ditch Dewey, because all your labels stay the same. So if it doesn't work, it's really easy to put everything back in traditional Dewey order because you don't have to change any labels. Um, you can also ditch it completely and replace it with a BISAC, which is kind of like how bookstores catalog their books. Um, you can use a homegrown system, you can use universal decimal classification, and you can use um, METIS. So I got some, I learned about some of these on this, uh, this Book Riot article here, so you could get more details of some of the alternatives there. But there's a lot of options. Different things might work better for you and your community. All right, if you are thinking about ditching Dewey, here's some of my top tips. I, I did fully ditch Dewey. I played with it for a couple years, um, adapting it, adjusting it using some flexible creative <laughs> reimaginings of it and then I eventually got to the point where I where I was confident and ready to completely ditch it and I did that in the last year or two um, it's going well so far I opted to go with a kind of a hybrid BISAC inspired system that looks like Dewey to my students but isn't um, so you could see it here you could see it in 900s for me is still general history but I've rearranged all the numbers so that they're a little bit more equitably, I hope, equitably dispersed. Um, so top tips. You need to do your due diligence. Ditching Dewey or adapting it isn't something you can just kind of do on a whim. You really have to put in a lot of research into studying what the current system is, why that's not working for you, and then researching what op whether other options there are. Um, and then determining which strategy to take. It's 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 labor intensive from a research standpoint. Um, you want to just make sure you you know what your plan is before you start because it's a big change. Um, you it can start or stay small scale. Um, it can be small things. You don't have to wait to triage. You don't have to get rid of Dewey entirely to fix some little things. I did that at first actually. I uh, we had a we were having requests for wellness and self help type books and students kept asking me where's your where's your wellness section or where's your self help section and we Dewey doesn't have one you know and so I was like oh it's so weird that it doesn't really have an obvious sort of section for that so I just carved one out I just found a vacant Dewey number um, like a number that is not currently assigned in the Dewey Decimal System and I just called that my health and wellness section number. And then I just started cataloging health and wellness books on that number. So they'd be all on the shelf together and we'd have a wellness section. So I just did that first, like within the first couple of years that I was working at my library. And that way, you know, it was a need. We were getting a lot of requests for it. Dewey didn't have it. So I just made it up. I just created it. You know, you don't have to wait to triage. If there's something that is really needed right now, you could just creatively problem solve that. Um, and you may want to put in time for advocacy and outreach if you're going to do a big change. There can be some um, initially uh, 
initially there can be some pushback from the community if, if they don't understand what you're doing and why. So it can really be helpful, whether it's with your community or your bosses or you know whoever is in, involved in making decisions at your space. Um, it, you may have to put in time to provide advocacy and education so that they understand the purpose of the changes you want to make and so that you have that support. You know, usually I think, I think transparency is usually best. People know why we're doing something and what the intended outcome is. You know, that's a lot easier to get support, I think. So this is a big change that you may want to put that time into. Um, labels are another important thing for Dewey, uh, ditching for nonfiction organizations. So you could see how I do it on the picture on the right. You could see that um, when I genrefied my fiction, I got half, I got circle stickers to put above the spine label. I wanted to make sure that there was a visual difference to my nonfiction section to help with making shelving quicker. So I opted to go for rectangular labels that go below the spine label. And each of the colored labels indicates a different um, neighborhood kind of in our new nonfiction section. So it's easier to know where to shelve things. Um, I use the Demco ones. I use the two and a half inch long. I can't remember what what the other size of it is, but it's I think two and a half inches long. I use those. Um, and again, I put the date on the bottom. You can see I wrote them there. But there are category specific category labels as well. Sometimes librarians opt to go with so I changed my spines. My spine labels are actually changed for nonfiction. So they actually have the name of their category, like what their topic is. But if you don't want to change all your spine labels, which would be a valid, valid issue because it was time consuming, um, you can buy ones that are already labeled. You can buy the words on it that you just add to the books. So that's another option as well. So again, no right or wrong way to label things. You just want to make sure it's clear to you and the shelvers, really, because it, the labels aren't really important to the browser because they're just in the they're browsing the area where the books are. But the labels are important for shelvers, so you want to make sure you pick a system that is clear. Okay, so those were the two big changes: genrefication, ditching Dewey. Those are really significant changes. They can be very labor intensive. They can sometimes require approval and permissions from, you know, your board or your bosses or your community. Um, now let's talk about some of the smaller scale things, the the quicker changes that you could still be doing as a librarian to help make your collections more accessible or navigable. Not everything has to be a big, massive change. There are little solutions too. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about displays, um, which can be permanent or rotating or temporary. Um, and we'll talk about pullout collections. So that's a common question we get. So let's talk about that. All right, pullout co collections. I don't know if there's a real name for these. It's just what I call them. Basically a smaller scale chunking uh, of a collection, again, just to help ease anxiety, make browsing easier. This is where you pull books out of whatever their technically correct category or section is, and you group them together to better meet your community's needs. And this is to improve access. So let me give you some examples, because I know this is a little bit vague sounding, but it's something we're all doing anyway, I think. <laughs> Here's some examples of pullout collections. Some librarians find that having their series mixed in with their standalones, especially at the elementary level where series can get very lengthy, um, that, that sometimes doesn't work. So it is common for some librarians to have popular series pulled out into their own section of bookcases uh, in order to not disrupt the kind of re regular organization of the books as much. And that's okay. You can do that. You can just create a section called popular series and give them their new spine label and then they get shelved together. Um, same thing for early readers, you know, people do it for board books, um, bios or memoirs, you know, a lot of times like they're technically supposed to be in the 920s, you know, in the do in Dewey, according to Dewey rules, but pretty common for libraries to pull biographies or memoirs out into their own section makes them a little bit more accessible and, and easier to find. They don't get lost amongst the nonfiction, general nonfiction as much. Uh, not graphic novel, you know, I think libraries have been doing this for years now. You know, technically graphic novels are categorized in the 740s in Dewey. 
um, which if you've ever worked in a library where you're serving children, especially at a school library at an elementary where you have to teach them about the organization of a library, um, what a headache it is to explain to them why graphic novels are in the nonfiction because they just don't get it. We teach them about how nonfiction is informational um, and that fiction is novels. And then we put graphic novels in the nonfiction to really mess with them. So that doesn't always make sense to your community. So a lot of times it may make sense to pull graphic novels into their own section. Um, same thing, comics, manga, poetry, maybe you're pulling classics out into their own section. Maybe you're just pulling mythology out of nonfiction so that it's over next to the fantasy books. Maybe that makes sense for you. Uh, maybe you're pulling nonfiction sports books out to shelve them closer to the sports fiction because you know there's so much crossover interest and appeal there from your users. Um, whatever high interest things that aren't usually cataloged to be near each other that you think should be near each other, you can do that. You have permission, you can do that. You can just make up a new category for them. I did that for these books in my fantasy section. Our fantasy section is large because the books are so large and the series are large. Um, and I was noticing that we have a lot of students still interested in Rick Reardon books. And I, I have buy, was buying all these, you know, Rick Reardon Presents and other fantasy books that I knew students that like Rick Reardon would love. But they were sprinkled so far throughout fantasy that they were getting overlooked and missed. And so I just created a subsection in our fantasy section, which is just called books if you like Rick Reardon, Percy Jackson, and mythology. And it's just, they just get shelved here. They're right across from the fantasy section. So they're still in kind of in their right area, but they're grouped together because this is, a, this is helpful to students to find books they may otherwise have missed that they may like. So I, you know, you could just do what needs to be done to your collection. You don't have to keep things in pristine, perfect, technically Dewey correct order. Here's some more examples. Uh, manga, I pulled out, you know, first I pulled graphic novels out of nonfiction and I had them all mixed together. Graphic novels, comic books, and manga were all mixed together. Um, and then that wasn't working. Our students were complaining about how hard it was to find um, the manga interspersed between the graphic novels and the comic books were so skinny, they were getting lost amongst everything. So I split them into three separate sections. And that's been working much better because even though there is crossover interest, a lot of students that like comic books will like graphic novels, will like manga. There's also quite a lot of very specific students that really specifically only like their, they want, they're here for manga, that's it. They're here for comic books, that's it. This helps them be a little bit more efficient in their browsing. And I still shelve them near each other though, because there's a lot of crossover appeal. I did the same with memoirs, classics, and poetry. I finally got the nerve to pull poetry and plays out of nonfiction this year. I've been wanting to do it for a couple of years. It, it has always annoyed me because I know I have students that are interested in poetry, but they never, ever, ever think to look in the nonfiction. They just assumed we didn't have any poetry. Um, and I finally was able to nail that down and realize that's what was happening. So I created a section over closer to fiction. So poetry has its own section now and they get checked out a lot more. And I just put them near classics. So it's, we basically just have a literary section now. That's what I call it. But it's plays, poets, poetry, and classics. And it really has been working for our community just because of the way they browse. They, they weren't thinking to look in nonfiction for that. And memoirs, we have a lot of memoir projects. So it makes sense for us to have memoirs separate. And then I do have memoirs genreified as well. So we have some common sort of types of memoirs. So they're grouped together. So small scale chunking in terms of pull out collections, um, we just discussed. Um, now, another type of small scale chunking is displays. We all do, well, a lot of us do displays. I would say it's pretty common aspect of librarianship. Um, you may have permanent displays, semi-permanent, rotating, temporary, all different kinds of displays. So let me show you some different ways that you can think about, um, this is just, again, little collections, chunking taking little groups of books and putting the sprinkling them around the room so that people who may be intimidated by long stretches of rows of books can sort of um, can sort of have some smaller collections to look at. That's really why displays are great. In addition to being promotional, of course. So I had two empty bookcases in our fiction section that I just didn't, I didn't currently need because of the way our genre is laid out. And so I just, I use them as a, I call it kind of a 
a permanent but rotating display. So this is where I, I display books to kind of highlight different representations that our students ask for. Um, and then when the books get checked out, I just find other books from the general collection to fill back in the empty spots. So these books don't live here permanently. They're just on a kind of a rotating display. And when they get checked back in later, they go back to their, their regular genre spots. Um, maybe there's things that you have people ask for a lot and you just kind of make a semi-permanent display. We, we don't have a love genre or a romance genre, but we do get asked for romance books a lot. So I just created a kind of semi-permanent display stand where we always have romance books on this display, but we change out which ones so that people that are looking for that can find them more easily. Um, you could use carts, you know, so you have bookcase displays as an option, you have little standing displays as an option. If you don't have any of those, you may have carts laying around that you could use, you know, any, any surface that you have available could be used as a display. Maybe you have an old cart laying around somewhere that isn't used for anything. Um, or your or windowsills or your surf desk or where, wherever you have space. Um, you have countertop displays. I have this one right next to our checkout, our self checkout station. So as we have new books available, people can just see what's new. Um, I have our permanent book talk display. The books on top of it change, but we've kept this up for two years now because it's, it's so popular. I mean, this table circulates like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, and again, I do have, a, I have to give a shout out again to the zigzag <laughs> display from Demco because I've just, I just am obsessed with these things. They're so cool. So you can see it on the top here where it, it has the books kind of like in their little zigzag caddy. And um, we're always refilling it because they get checked out a lot. So it helps to show them off a little. So you can, yeah, that one's just a, just a folding table, by the way. It's just a cheap folding table that I found, and I just put a, a little color tabletop tablecloth on top. So it doesn't have to be fancy, you know, it can be whatever you can find. Uh, top tips. Again, let community interests drive your decisions. What are the things that people are always asking for? And you're always having to go walk through the shelves and pull five to show to show people every time. You know, if you're constantly having people ask for ro for love books or romance books, or they're always asking for friends or enemies to lovers books or whatever the common request is maybe you make a little a little display for that that you just kind of keep running they don't all have to be big monthly specific theme displays they can just be common interest displays um trial and error you know try different things see what works use what you have do you have carts laying around do you have folding tables do you have window sills do you have end caps that you can put little shelves on do you have tables around the library? You could just put a couple books standing up in the center of the table. Um, you can put them on the edge of your circulation desk, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can do displays wherever you can find room. It doesn't have to be big fancy displays. It can be whatever little random cart you have, whatever little corner of the room you can find, you know, you can still make use of the space. So a little creative thinking. All right, and then last but not least, maybe definitely not least, is signage. Signage is really critical, especially if you're rethinking organization, if you're changing things on your patrons, it's really important that you provide extremely clear and obvious and readable navigators for them. So signage is very important. You can see I'm a bit of a signage fanatic. You can see that I have you know signs on the top of every bookcase. And then I have signs in nonfiction on every shelf. And because I don't want students to be confused or overwhelmed, I want them to be able to know exactly what they're looking at so that they can decide whether it's something they're interested in. When I do orientations, I keep it simple. I tell students, if you're not sure what you're looking at, just look up and the sign will tell you what kind of books you're looking at. And it really does help. Helps with browsing for sure. So great signage helps make the library more accessible to library users. Um, great signage, you know, it has to be signage that is accessible as well, that is readable, that provides the information that they need. So think about that as well. Um, some examples, you know, I just showed you some of the different ones I have. Um, shelf talkers, series labels, fine labels, these are all different ways where we provide information. We wanna make sure that the information we're providing is accessible 
So think about is the font legible to most people? Is it in a language that most of your users, um, you know, use? Um, it does, is there imagery to help, you know? Having related imagery can help make signs more accessible. Um, you can see just one random example. I, I was noticing students were constantly having to come ask me which number of the Black Butler books it was because they use Roman numerals on that manga series. My students don't know Roman numerals, so they couldn't tell which book they needed to get next. So when I had like the fifth person ask me to translate that for them, I just thought to myself, why don't I just, why don't I just cover it with Arabic numerals? So I just printed labels and covered it. And now my students can can determine which book on their own. They don't need help. So this is how, like little things, you can remove barriers. Um, so shelf dividers, this is one signage. This is, um, these are these are Demco shelf dividers and signs. So they serve two purposes, which is kind of cool. Um, and so you could see they have different ones. They have letters, they have specific topics. And they also have in here, when you go in here, they have custom, like you can customize and create your own as well. Like if you have certain categories, you need a, one of these four, you can um, have those ordered as well in the same shape and style. So that's pretty cool. They're um, like hard, they're like firm so that they stand up real nice and straight. And uh, these can be really helpful for keeping, you know, books organized. I know, especially in nonfiction, it can get tight, you know, with our shelving. So it's nice to have helpful signage on the, on the shelves. Um, I created Mayan. Um, I DIY'd Mayan. Uh, they're not as, as sturdy, obviously, and, and they were quite labor intensive to make, but it serves similar purpose, except that they don't really help divide shelves because they're not firm enough for that. Um, but they do help provide some navigation. So just in case anybody else wants a budget uh, DIY option, I just used really long folders and I, I made the signs in Canva and printed them and, and then I glued them onto the folders. So it works. Yeah, they don't, they probably won't hold up forever, but it works for now. Um, other labels and directionals, again, just think of what you can add to shelves to provide greater accessibility and navigation. You know, what, what are the barriers you're seeing? Are you constantly having people have to look up series orders on their phones or have to come up and say, which, which book is number two in this series? You know, maybe, maybe it makes sense for you to take the time to add series labels to your books. It was one of the first things I did because the students were always asking, and it was so worth it. I, I have actually ha I actually have students that um, thank me for it. <laughs> they are so relieved to have an easy way of knowing what book is goes in what order. They really like that. And some some series do it like they print it on the covers, but some don't. Um, but you can see I hand I actually hand type ours um, with the title of the series and the number. But you don't have to do that to still get the same benefit. You could buy number labels. Uh, like Demco has the numbers and you can just buy number labels and just put the numbers at the top and that's still going to help patrons be able to tell what book goes in what order um, so it's a really kind of a very simple solution to help provide extra accessibility so just remember if the rules aren't working for your community you can change the rules that's how we develop accessible collections I know we sometimes worry about whether we can change this or not, um, but the truth is that there's really there's no library police coming and checking. You know, your 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 drive is to make sure the library is working for your users. And so, if there are changes that need to be made to make it work better for your users, then it's worth considering. And that is how we develop accessible collections. Whoops, backwards. Okay, okay. Thank you for attending. That is that is the webinar. I also was very proud of this, so I'm gonna show it. <laughs> Too much fun. Anyway, what a dork. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, and the the links to the Shelf Spark collection, which um has most of the things I showed were, are in there, that's on this last slide for you all as well. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um we do just have five minutes. I'm glad you mentioned that um, this resource of the slides will be sent out and be available along with the webinar. It will have links to the product shown. We did have a question about the, the, the zigzag display, so that will be in there. You can also find it at um, demco.com backslash shelf spark. That's the collection that's gonna have all of the creative shelving solutions. 
so you can head over there. Uh, we have four minutes, so maybe I'll throw you a question or two if we can. Sure. Uh, we have a few. Any questions that we feel weren't covered throughout because some rolled in pretty early and then you did end up addressing them, but any questions that came in that we really didn't get to, there were a couple. We're going to ask Kelsey if she'll sit down and, and write some answers or, or direct you to some answers that we can send that out with the resources as well since we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, but one of the ones that we got was when you are um, showing a book in a display, how do you signify to people looking up that book that it's on a display and not shelved where it normally is? Yeah, that's a problem I'm currently working to address, actually. Uh, my current solution at the moment is I use sublocations for my genres. So my current solution for some of the displays is that I have an alternate sublocation, which is like, so I have a sublocation for fantasy, and then I have a sublocation for fantasy or on display. <laughs> so then I, I put that tag on the books that way, because sometimes they get returned and then they get reshelved in their regular fantasy section without me knowing to go change the tag. So I don't use a display specific tag, but we do have some of the, the ones that are commonly chosen for display. I do have that, but I'm hoping to contact our, our um, library management software to see if there are any solutions in the works that would make maybe it a little bit more easy. <laughs> but I do welcome any advice for anybody who has problem solved this because it is currently something I'm working to address as well. Great, thank you. And then we had another one about measuring success. So how are you sharing out how successful the genrefication process is? We do, um, I do, um, the for the quantitative, uh, the circulation stats usually are kind of the biggest driving factor. I mean, I didn't, I don't think I included the, the graphic in this webinar, but I did in the other one. It shows the year, you know, the years before we genrefied and the circulation compared just even one year later is drastic i mean i think it doubled or tripled the first year or i think it doubled the first year and tripled by the second year so the circulation is one of the biggest indicators for us the qualitative is the observational so just observing that you know my students are um self-selecting more you know that some of that is qualitative i share that information out usually in our um end of year reports and our new our newsletters and uh social media so that just the community kind of is aware um, but it's a little bit of a mixture of the CERC with some of the qualitative observations. Great, thank you. And then you touched on this a little bit, but when you um, were working on eliminating the Dewey Decimal System um, in your program, did you keep biographies separate or did you interfile them in your system? I, yeah, that's a good question. I, I didn't keep we don't have many biographies because we, our high school doesn't really do any research for it. And so we have webinar, we have um, memoirs more. So I decided to keep them separate because some of the projects require them to read a memoir specifically and they can't, it's, they can't do a biography. So I have the biographies um, interfiled with their um, relevant neighborhoods. So, you know, one on uh, Einstein is in with the physics books and so on and so forth so that's how i address biographies again depends it may very much depend what makes sense for you it will depend on how your library is used and what the common sort of needs are i know in elementary libraries in particular biography research is really common so it would make sense probably to have a biography section in that case um, so di different kind of needs may make more sense Great. Well, we are, it looks like we're right at time. Um, so any questions that we didn't get to or that we feel haven't weren't covered throughout this presentation, we will put together along with these slides. Again, the recording will be available in an email. It usually takes about a week for that to go out, but it will also be on our website once that's available. And if you missed the first one, by all means, go check it out. We've also got a couple um, blogs that Kelsey wrote on our behalf. So we thank you all very much for attending and um, hopefully we'll have some, some fresh new webinars for you to attend coming up soon and uh, you'll be on the email list to get all of that information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone.